five months ago I made a video on a PC that was epic for live streaming and editing at $550. Yeah, that's right, at that price point you could just about afford some shit out back from 2005. Alright, bit of a hyperbole but grab your credit card because this is an overdue update for an epic $550 editing and live streaming PC. Now I'm just gonna make this stupidly clear right off the get go. This PC will not play games, at least not AAA demanding ones. I'm sure Portal, CSGO, Minesweeper and MOBAs as a whole would work fine, but this PC is not meant for that. At $550 I simply couldn't fit an i7 Skylake and a GPU at that price point. I'll focus more on the actual aspects of editing and this should be a great build if you play on console and want to edit, record and even livestream at 1080p 60fps without any hiccups. And because of this, I haven't included a GPU, but instead a really, really powerful CPU. If you want to record console gameplay, you do still need to get a capture card, but I'll leave that up to you. Some background on this, I have build guides on my channel for those who have never built a PC before, and this PC will not include rebates to make it friendly for future viewers looking to buy a system like this. Also, this is just the tower or the PC. It does not include the mouse, keyboard, monitor, headset, that sort of stuff, and doesn't include an OS. Anyway, with that out of the way, let's get into it. Starting with the CPU of the Intel Core i7 6700 3.4GHz quad core processor, coming in at just shy of $300. This is a steal especially compared to what it used to be half a year ago. This is obviously what we've put the most amount of money towards and that's for good reason. The CPU in our system will do everything, well fetching, decoding and executing cycles anyway. But this equates to us handling all the tasks such as streaming, editing, rendering and the lot. This is a 4 core CPU with hyperthreading on the Skylake architecture and our hyperthreading is the main difference between getting an i5 and an i7. And whilst it doesn't double your core count or physical processor count, it will double your logical processor count. Basically, you have twice the amount of threads as you have cores, so 4 cores, 8 threads, which will help you out massively in editing and streaming. Also, if you have noticed, this CPU is exactly the same as the highly regarded i7-6700K, which everyone is banging on about except from one difference, and that's the overclocking ability. This would not allow you to overclock, at least not from Intel's side. I think they've patched that with a microcode, but for most of you, you probably wouldn't overclock it anyway. Nor would a system like this see massive performance gains from overclocking. But you should know that although the CPU does run at 3.4 GHz, it will boost itself to 4.0 GHz when performing stressful tasks such as streaming, rendering, blah 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 blah. A 4.0 GHz boost clock is alarmingly good. See what I did there? Yeah, I'll just hear myself out. Okay, yeah, I get it, that was a terrible joke to begin with, I'll just go kill myself now. Basically, this is a monster, and it saves us over 20 bucks by not going with the i7-600K, as well as stops us from having to buy a more expensive motherboard to benefit from these said features. Also, this boost clock is coincidentally the same as the i7-6700K, or is it coincidental? Anyway, when you're live streaming and editing, you will want to go with the best CPU you can. This CPU will not hiccup, and that said, with all the encoding and processing a CPU has to do, you simply won't get the same results if you plan to step down to an i5, since you will have to reduce your frame rate to 30fps resolution of 720p, something of that nature, or even massively drop down your bitrate. Unlike last time, this time the AMD FX8350 wasn't even considered, and that's for good reason, because there are two main problems with it. One is that it has really bad IPC instructions per clock, and this means that it can't do as many things per clock than an Intel CPU, which in streaming is vital. And the way it compensates for this is by having extremely high clock speed, but it's just not the same. The second issue is that AMD chips, beside their APUs, don't have integrated graphics, or iGPUs. So whilst we're using onboard to save money, if you went with AMD you would have to buy a separate graphics card, and the mobiles themselves are also somewhat a little more expensive. So in essence, we'd be paying the same price and getting worse performance. So I just want to talk a little more about Intel's iGPU, for this build at least, because we're not going with a GPU. The CPU comes with Intel HD 530 graphics, where you'd plug your monitors into the motherboard instead of the graphics card. Now whilst relatively this gives really bad performance in games, it's still quite a bit better than the Intel 4300 graphics we've seen on Haswell chips, and this chip can run up to three monitors at the same time, just off of the integrated graphics. One thing to note is that the motherboard we've chosen only has one output port for this though, so you're limited to a connection through HDMI. I'll go more over that in a second. As for the CPU cooler, yes, I've actually included one of these. It is the Cooler Master Vortex Plus 54.8 CFM sleeve bearing CPU cooler, costing us $26 which is $4 less than the Hyper-D12. Here's the thing though, we won't be overclocking, which is the main reason why people go with aftermarket coolers, due to the lower temps. The other one is how inexpensive it is, because these are budget coolers, and lastly, the noise. Sure, you do get stock cooler with this, now Intel engineers obviously aren't foolish, or stupid for that matter, 
they're not going to ship you a CPU cooler if it couldn't handle the CPU temps, or the CPU really. However, it will still run much hotter, meaning faster hardware degradation, and will still be pretty loud. Since when you consider that we're not running a GPU, this will probably be the loudest component within our system. Now, after Monkey Cooler touches this one, look alright, it won't break the bank, and I recommend you go for one because we have the budget for it. But you should know that stock coolers aren't bad, they're just not great. Onto the motherboard, now for this I did decide to go with the Ubite GH110M, a Micro ATX LG1151 motherboard, costing us $46. Now this MOBA is in a Micro ATX form factor, as you'll see with the case, and well for the price, it's a really good deal. No, it's not as good as a H170 or even Z170 board for that matter, but it'll do what we need it to. If you look at the Intel spec sheet, you'll notice that this doesn't support overclocking and whilst it's not specifically mentioned, it's a budget version of the ones mentioned earlier, like 10 seconds ago. But the fact that it doesn't support overclocking won't be a problem anyway, since the CPU doesn't either. Good times. There are a few things you should note there. While the CPU does support up to three displays, I'm pretty sure through Intel HD graphics, the motherboard only has a single output to connect to a monitor, being HDMI 1.4. That's no problem for single display users, which is the majority. However, if you want more than one display to function with this build, you will need to pick up a graphics card. It doesn't have to be a very good one, let alone one to play games. A small GT610 is really easy to find, pretty cheap as well, or what I personally recommend, and that's just buying a second-hand GPU. This member only has two DIMM slots, so with the RAM configuration I've sorted, this won't be a problem, and max support speed is 2133 MHz, which again, is not that important, but this would make a large difference if you are gaming on it, but then again, 2133 is plenty fast compared to most common speeds of DDR3. Max memory or RAM is 32GB, but don't worry about that. I'll go over that more in a second, and this MOBA is neither Crossfire nor SLI support. If you know your computers, then you know what SLI and Crossfire is. It's basically living life on the edge, building your wings on the way down, only to have them break when you reach the concrete. Now for me, personally, I wouldn't really recommend it, and it's a far reach. Why? Well, because many games do offer performance scaling, obviously because you've got two or more GPUs in there. Scaling is often terrible or not on par, and you're not guaranteed to have it work. For some games such as XCOM, Tomb Raider, The Division Beta, and even Assassin's Creed Syndicate, yeah, the game that not many people did initially get because of the shit show that was Unity, the game's SLI performance, at launch at least, was actually worse than single car performance, introducing bad driver support for multi-GPU configs, stuttering, and worse drops in performance than that F you got in maths class. Anyway, enough about me rambling on it, as 4 to per second SATA ports, meaning you can attach up to 4 drives, not including the many more you can get from PCIe and USB based storage, as well as having onboard LAN and sound. So no, you won't need a sound card, and as for rear I.O., you have two PS2 ports, one already mentioned HDMI 1.4 port, two USB 3.0 ports, and four USB 2.0 ports. And then you get three audio jacks. Pretty common stuff. But for most people, that will also be plenty, and the front panel USB only comes with one USB 3.0 and one USB 2.0 port. Simples. As for the motherboard software side of things, well, it does come with CFOS speed, which is just like MSI Killer Gaming software. This is saying that you're supposed to get less lag in games. I'm actually doing air quotes. Now, I'm not sure about you, but this thing's brought so much anger and frustration. Yes, I've been diagnosing an audio problem to do with these bullshit LAN drivers and software for the last three months. Install different ones and avoid them like the fucking plague. But to keep this video reasonably short, you do have cloud storage, which allows you to control certain aspects of your PC from your smartphone, which is great if you leave it on when you're out. And lastly, things like easy tune overclocker, simple and standard stuff. Now for memory, I went with G-Skill AG's 8GB 1x8GB DDR4-2133MHz, costing us $31. One of the cheapest 8GB RAM modules, which doesn't look like a 4 year old's toy, and alright speeds for DDR4, but nothing special. But with this max support speed on the motherboard being 2133 anyway, it doesn't really matter. As for why I went with one module over two, 8GB will be enough to do edits, streams, and all the rest, but choosing to go with one module over two will allow you to add an additional 8GB module at a later date to make a total of 16GB, because maths. This will in turn make things more fluid like running multiple programs, make your editing more responsive, and will just give an improved user experience. You should know that when you've just got one module in there, it won't run a dual channel. Now for storage, we've got two devices, the first being an SSD, which is an Aviator Premier SP 550 120GB 2.5-inch solid state drive, costing us $39. One dollar less than five months ago. Yeah, savings. And it has good balance between price and speed, or you're saving about $10 or more if you'd otherwise have gone with a Samsung or Kingston. So for this SSD, we are going to be installing our OS and primary applications such as your editing programs, OBS, and the rest on this. But this isn't a lot of space to be honest, but you can always add more, up to the two drives at least, just from the onboard SATA. And for this purpose, it's enough. 
If you already installed a version of Windows on your older computer, say, and you don't want to wipe the drive and you want to just like transfer it over, then use a free SSD migration tool. It's not as difficult as you think, and getting an SSD will not only boost performance massively, at least in speed, but make the overall experience better, especially when you're booting the computer or loading applications. Now the second drive is a Western Digital Caviar Blue 1TB 3.5 inch 7200 RPM internal hard drive, costing us $47. This is a great drive with a mass storage solution for your PC, and this is where you'll keep all of your video files, edits, gameplays, and any other archive on here. This has a really low failure rate and with WDO extremely reliable. When you pair this with an SSD, it's a killer combination and is often what most people do end up getting if they have two drives. It's a really sick combination between speed, capacity and price. One terabyte is more than enough for most people and this is what I personally use. <laughs> Looking for geek and gaming collectibles? Well then Loot Crate has you covered. Now Loot Crate is essentially Comic Con in a box. Every month there's new goodies from collectibles to apparel to tech gadgets and other epic gear. Save 10% on any new subscription at trylootcrate.com forward slash proto and enter the promo code BRIDGE10 for 10% savings. Check out the link in the video description to learn more. Okay, so at this point I normally recommend a GPU, but for streaming it's not that important and doesn't do much. Okay, so to clarify, OBS uses the GPU for compositing all the different layers into one stream, scaling and anti-aliasing. The thing is that the CPU can handle all of this and whilst it might reduce the CPU load a little by going with a GPU, it's not worth spending the extra $100 or something like that for a GTX 650 or Radeon HD 6850 or even more expensive GPUs. For editing, GPUs either support CUDA or OpenSeal, the new ones at least, but unless you're using Adobe Premiere, you don't need it. For example, Sony Vegas has that option, but it doesn't support the majority of newish GPUs because optimization for the software is absolute ass. If you do have the money then sure, go invest in it, but it's not necessary and I can't imagine you'll see a worthwhile improvement. And so next we have the case, now for this option I did go with the Fractal Design Core 1100 Micro ATX Mini Tower case, costing us $29, and it's perfect for the price, it's a small Micro ATX case, internally it has room for two drives, not the four your motherboard supports, so you are going to be using them all in one go, and it has room for two five and a quarter inch bays, for something like a Horsop Caddy DVD drive, why you'd want to go with a DVD drive, I have absolutely no clue, but the hot stop caddies do look really appealing, especially since you can now make use of those four SATA ports. But overall this is a budget case and whilst it does lack features of expensive cases, it is good cable management, more drive base, for the price it's not bad and still looks really clean. Lastly we need to have a power supply, in this case I want the EVJ 430W A plus certified ATX power supply, costing us only $33. 430 watts is more than enough, since we're not using a dedicated graphics card, and whilst this isn't the most impressive PSU, it's cheap, has 80 plus efficiency, and still has enough juice if you want to add a low power graphics card. Anyway, overall the price of this build is $550.75, and I can't exactly show you benchmarks, so we're not planning to run games on even synthetic ones like Cinebench or Passmark, they won't really help you out. This build won't have a problem streaming 1080p 60fps, or rendering in Premiere, After Effects, or Sony Vegas, at all, especially with that insane CPU. Anyway, hopefully you have enjoyed this video and if you did be sure to give it a like and share it with your friends if they're looking for a similar system like this. Thanks for watching, this has been Proto and I'll see you in my next one. Adios! I'll focus more on the actual aspects of editing, it would be great if you're planning to build a console. Build a console, really.